exhaustive in here today. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here today. Uh, I am joined by Dr. Joe Kanner, as usual, with the Louisiana Department of Health, but also today by Dr. Miranda Mitchell, who is an internal medicine specialist with LSU Health. Uh, I'm going to brief you, and then each of them will come up and uh, offer some prepared remarks. They will each take your questions, and I'll come wrap up and then, and then take your questions as well as well. I know it's been a while uh, since we've had one of these updates um, and quite frankly that's because Louisiana has been doing much better and continues today uh, to do uh, very well in terms of our baseline numbers with respect to COVID as it relates to percent positivity, the number of cases, uh, number of hospitalizations and, and so forth. Uh, not that the pandemic is over, it's not. Um, it, and, and quite frankly, in some parts of the country, you're seeing uh, the Delta surge happen that actually happened here uh, back in the August and September uh, time frame. We're on the backside of that surge, hoping and praying that we don't have another one. But we're also working to prepare uh, for one because we, we know that that's the right thing to do. And that really is what brings us before you today. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about... Uh, the Omicron variant uh, and we wanted you to have this update so that everybody is on the same page about what we're doing here in Louisiana what we know now uh, quite frankly there's still a lot that we don't know there's a lot that the world uh, doesn't know about this particular variant um, it has obviously been uh, deemed uh, and I think um, classified as a variant of concern by the World Health Organization and it was really a week ago today that they sounded uh, uh, that, uh, I don't want to say sounded the alarm, but they made this, uh, this big announcement about this particular variant because uh, I think it was first detected in South Africa, but now we know it's in at least 36 countries. Uh, I think as of today, it's in five states. Um, and I want to, to make sure you, you're aware we haven't yet detected it in Louisiana. That certainly doesn't mean that it isn't here, um, but we know that it is in New York, Hawaii, Colorado, California, and Minnesota. Uh, and given the nature of pandemics and how the virus spreads and how these variants uh, move, uh, we can anticipate that there will be additional cases all over the world and all over the country. Um, and we are trying uh, very hard uh, through surveillance measures and, and testing and sequencing uh, to detect uh, whether the uh, variant is here in Louisiana. Uh, we've not detected one. And I want to be clear about that. I also want to be clear that as soon as we do, if we do, um, then we will make sure that you all know it, that the people of Louisiana know as much about that as possible. Uh, it's also fair to say that there's an awful lot of studies going on here in the country and around the world to understand uh, this Omicron variant. Uh, for example, do the standard PCR and antigen tests detect this variant uh, as they have uh, with previous ones? Um, is this variant more transmissible? And if so, to what degree? Is it more virulent or not? And if so, to what degree? What kind of response uh, would an individual get uh, from a vaccine? Uh, if they are infected by this variant as opposed to other variants. And then you have therapeutic treatments out there, whether it's remdesivir or uh, monoclonal antibody infusions. The upcoming um, uh, availability, we believe, at least uh, initially, I know the recommendation is for a uh, pharmaceutical intervention by Merck uh, and potentially one by um, uh, Pfizer that would that would be a regimen of pills that you would that you would take after having a uh, uh, test reveal that, that you're positive. So there's a lot of studies underway. There's some things we know. There's many things that we don't. And I'm really going to let Dr. Kanner get into more of that in just a moment. I do want you to know that LDH um, has established a network of laboratories uh, and it is proactively doing genomic sequencing on positive COVID cases. 
which essentially means that they're looking at the genetic code of the virus to determine if it's the Omicron uh, variant or any other variant. Uh, and we have the capacity, at least at current numbers, uh, to genetically sequence 100% of all of the positive uh, PCR tests uh, that, that are happening across the state, and they continue to happen uh, every single day, as you all know. Um, I also want to, to make clear that while we're here today talking about the Omicron variant, uh, today in Louisiana, as best we know, virtually 100% of all the cases are attributable to the Delta variant. Uh, this is the same variant that led us into the, the surge uh, late this summer uh, and caused the highest hospitalization rate uh, that we've experienced to date, uh, primarily uh, because of transmission to an infection of those who uh, were not uh, fully vaccinated. So if you contract COVID in Louisiana right now, uh, you're almost certainly going to have the Delta variant. And I don't really know what difference that makes uh, to an individual because you, you have COVID um, and, and it's, it's uh, contagious. Uh, and we, we know uh, that, that outcomes can be serious, especially for those who are not vaccinated fully uh, or those uh, whose, whose immunity from the vaccination is waned because of the, the uh, lapse of, of time or perhaps because you are more vulnerable to disease given your age or your health condition. Uh, and that brings me to the next point. Uh, your best protection from COVID-19, regardless of the variant uh, that, that you're thinking about or that you might be exposed to, whether it's Delta, Omicron, or anything else, is to get yourself vaccinated, fully vaccinated, uh, getting your children uh, who are eligible uh, vaccinated, other loved ones. Um, and then af after you're vaccinated, uh, as soon as you're eligible for a booster, uh, and by the way, you saw the federal government moved recently to the same policy that we went to in Louisiana previously, uh, and that is all adults 18 and above, once you are six months beyond the second dose of Pfizer or Madonna uh, vaccines, you're eligible for a booster, uh, and it's two months after your one shot of Johnson & Johnson. So vaccinations uh, to include uh, the boosters, critically important if you want to protect yourself and your family and the community. And really that's the way out of this pandemic uh, with the least uh, cases, the least uh, sickness and hospitalizations uh, and deaths. Right now, around 49% of Louisiana's population is fully vaccinated. Clearly that's not enough. Uh, we, we have not uh, been vaccinated in the numbers that we need. Uh, a little more than two and a half million people have at least started uh, the vaccination process. Um, and and we got to get those numbers up. And so I'm again appealing to the people of Louisiana. Uh, if you've started your vaccination series, make sure that you complete it. If you've completed it, get boosted as soon as you're eligible. And if you haven't started yet, uh, please do that. Go, go talk to your, your doctor, other healthcare uh, professional. Get your questions answered. And I do want to thank those people who have been vaccinated uh, because you're making the smartest, best decision for yourself, but it's also the best decision for your family and for your community uh, and for the state. And, and I'll remind you, if you're vaccinated, uh, you're less likely uh, to contract the disease. And so transmission is reduced. Uh, in the proportion to which the, the population is vaccinated. Mutations happen as a function of transmission. And if we can drive down transmission here and elsewhere around the country and around the world, you see less of the variants that then cause uh, concerns such as the Omicron variant that we're dealing with today. Uh, obviously, we want to continue to make, uh, to have good hygiene practice Masking, uh, if it's indicated for you under CDC guidelines, remains uh, important. Uh, and you're going to hear a little bit more in a moment about travel gatherings, holiday events, and, and, and put that into perspective by looking back at what happened uh, last year. So making good decisions. You know, an outdoor event uh, is still 
uh, 19 times less likely to produce a, an infection uh, as the same event held indoors. Uh, so there, all of those things that we've been talking about for many, many months uh, remain uh, in play. So at this time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a break, ask Dr. Cantor to come up, then Dr. Mitchell, uh, when they're finished with their prepared remarks and questions, and I'll come back up, uh, wrap up, and then take your questions as well. Dr. Cantor? Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Hope everyone had a, a restful and a, a safe Thanksgiving, and I will wish happy Hanukkah to anyone who celebrates. Um, as the governor insinuated, um, we're paying very close attention to Omicron right now, and we're in close contact with the CDC and colleagues from across the country. At this point, I'll tell you, it's not the time to panic, uh, but it is time to be paying attention and to perhaps take a couple precautions right now. Um, I'm going to go through what we know, what we don't know, where we're at, where we might be headed, and then um, we'll be happy to take any questions afterwards. I'll tell you, what we, what we don't know is, is a larger bucket right now than, than what we do know, and that's the situation we find ourselves in. What do we know right now? Um, new variant Omicron was identified um, in swabs that were collected on the 11th of November and the 14th of November from samples in South Africa and Botswana. Before I go farther, I need to say this. Everything we know right now about Omicron is because of the transparency and generosity of collaboration with our scientific colleagues in South Africa and Botswana. So we owe them a debt of gratitude. They were immediately transparent about this. And we, as a state, country, and a world, will be able to respond better because of their partnership in this. I have to say that. Um, on November 26th, the day after Thanksgiving, the WHO essentially rang the bell on this and, and labeled Omicron as a variant of concern. That was after some preliminary data showing it increasing uh, quite rapidly in a particular province of South Africa, the province that includes the town of Johannesburg. Of particular note, this variant has a lot of mutations from the baseline COVID uh, virus, about 50 mutations in total, 30 of which are on the spike protein. The spike protein is the part of the COVID virus that allows it to gain entry into the cell. It's a particularly important part. It's a part that's targeted by vaccines and some therapeutics, and that's what a lot of the discussion is focusing on right now. Because of that high number of mutations, there are theoretical concerns for increased transmissibility of this variant and resistance to therapeutics, medicines we take like monoclonal antibodies, resistance to vaccines that we have available to us, and resistance to the partial protection one gets from having been infected with COVID in the past. Theoretical concerns. As the days and weeks go on, we will either verify or reject those theoretical concerns as more data comes in. One piece of data came in uh, yesterday and today, and it's a unpeer-reviewed report from some physicians in South Africa that suggests for people who did have prior infection with COVID but are not vaccinated, they perhaps have a three times greater chance of reinfection with Omicron than they did with Delta. That's preliminary. That's not yet confirmed. Again, data is coming in fast and furious right now. And like we've done throughout COVID, we do the best job we can to make sense of it. And we know more and more as time goes on. Um, so far, and this could have changed in the 12 minutes we've been here, Omicron has been identified in 36 countries, including, as the governor said, the US. It's in the five states uh, that the governor mentioned. And of the U.S. cases right now, it includes both individuals who have recently traveled to Southern Africa and individuals who did not and presumably were exposed here to other people who did. It includes people who both were pre previously fully vaccinated and not, and it includes people who were priorly infected with COVID and not. So it really has run the gamut. The presumption right now 
for all the reasons the governor gave, is that, of course, Omicron is in the U.S. in larger numbers than the handful of cases that have been formally identified right now. With the degree of spread, with worldwide travel, that's just a fair presumption to make. It very well could be in, in Louisiana. We have not identified it yet. As the governor said, once we do, we will report that out immediately. But for all intents and purposes, with the way the world works right now, it's certainly in greater numbers than we've been able to formally identify. What don't we know right now? We don't have great data about how transmissible this variant will be. Again, there's theoretical data based on the number of mutations and where those mutations are, that it will be more transmissible. It's certainly been increasing in numbers in South Africa. In some parts of South Africa, it appears to be outcompeting Delta. That was the previously uh, most abundant variant there. But these are all relatively uh, preliminary and theoretical concerns. Until we get more data and more time to see what happens, we won't have a more definitive answer about how transmissible it is, and that's a crucial, crucial question. We don't know how virulent this variant will be, and by that I mean how likely are you to get really sick by it? Is it more likely to give people mild illness? Is it more likely to give people severe illness? There's some preliminary antidotal reports from a few physicians in South Africa that the patients they have seen have been less sick, had more mild symptoms with Omicron. That's confounded a little bit because the initial cluster was tied to a university in South Africa, so the age of the individuals who had it were, was young, so not, not, not as likely as older people to get that sick. That's the data we have now. We'll learn more in the next week or two about how virulent this is. And, and importantly, we don't have great data now on the degree to which this new variant may be resistant to our therapeutics, meaning our monoclonal antibodies and other therapeutics, resistance to the polyclonal antibodies one receives from being vaccinated, and resistant to the polyclonal antibodies one receives from having prior infection. We do know that the, pr the protection one gets from prior infection is incomplete and not as strong as the protection one gets not as complete or durable as the protection one gets from being fully vaccinated. I'll note there have been a number of variants over the past 21 months of this pandemic that we have kept our eyes on that had concerning characteristics, some of which ended up causing a big problem for us. Delta certainly is an example of that, some of which did not. Sometimes you just don't know until you have more data and you see what happens. We also had variants that we've kept our eye on that did have resistance to the vaccines. Thankfully, they didn't prove to be all that transmissible and didn't cause a problem here too. So it's really difficult to take any one data point here and hang your hat on it. The point I'm making is the prudent thing to do right now is to pay very close attention and to do your best to prepare. But until we get some more data and some more experience with this, it's hard to predict what exactly will happen and what exactly the effect will be here in Louisiana. What are we doing here in Louisiana to better prepare? First and foremost, and this is the most important thing, we continue to push vaccinations in the strongest terms possible. These vaccines are safe. These vaccines are effective. And even in the scenario that we learn, perhaps, that this variant has some resistance to vaccines, and I'm saying this hypothetically now, it is far, far unlikely that that will be absolute resistance. The much more likely scenario is that it will be some degree of reduced resistance, meaning that the vaccines will still be some degree of effective. It's not all or nothing. It rarely is all or nothing. So the single best thing we can do now is to continue to encourage, promote, and reduce barriers to vaccinations. And that's what the Louisiana Department of Health has been doing throughout this time. We are increasing our surveillance, our ability to track this variant if and when it does become identified in 
Louisiana. Uh, as the governor said, we now have the capacity to genomically sequence 100% of all the PCR positive tests run in the state. And we'll be looking to do that. We have asked testers, anyone that does PCR testing throughout the state, to send their positive PCR tests to us in our lab so that we can sequence those. There is an added benefit of this variant, and that is for some types of PCR tests, for PCR tests that are run on a platform produced by the company Thermo Fisher, which is some but not all of the PCR tests we run in Louisiana, you can actually flag a presumptive positive of Omicron before you sequence it. Sequence it takes some time. PCR tests are relatively quick. And so because of this quirk, I'll say, of the variant, and it was the same with the alpha variant, by the way, the one that was initially identified in the UK months ago, um, we can get a head start on identifying variants if they do come here. So we've reached out to the labs, the handful of labs in Louisiana that are using this particular testing platform, the Thermo Fisher TACPATH platform. And if they do get this characteristic readout, which is a preliminary flag, it might be Omicron, they're going to communicate that quickly with us and we'll be transparent about that as well. So that's all to our advantage. That means that if and when this variant does spread in Louisiana, we are going to have excellent visibility on that. That's a skill that has been building over the past few months. It's really to our benefit now. And, and also I'll note that we continue to provide staffing support to about 60 hospitals so that they can remain prepared. It still is hard to recruit and retain qualified healthcare personnel, particularly nurses and respiratory techs. So we're continuing to provide that assistance so that we are ready if we need to be in Louisiana. I'll note again, we're better off right now than we were a year ago. There's just no question about that. We have better therapeutics. We have monoclonal antibodies. We have on the very near horizon pills, antiviral pills that will also help treat COVID. The company Merck has a pill called Monopiravir that is on the verge of likely receiving emergency use authorization by the FDA. And the company Pfizer has a similar pill that we expect to receive authorization shortly thereafter. All of this builds our arsenal. None of it is a silver bullet. None of it in and of itself is a game changer, but it's an additional tool that will allow us to reduce morbidity and mortality from COVID should people get infected. We have many more people vaccinated than we did this time last year. It's not enough. Just about just a, a shade below 50% of the general population of Louisiana is now fully vaccinated. That's not where it needs to be, but it's also not insignificant. We've had many more exposures here, and the CDC now ranks it at about 40% of the general population has been exposed to COVID in the past in Louisiana. The protection one gets from prior exposure is incomplete, partial, imperfect, not terribly durable, but it also is not to be wholesale disregarded. What we do know is that if you have been exposed to COVID in the past, your protection will more than double if you get vaccinated, even though you had COVID in the past. As the governor mentioned, we're, we're in a relatively good place right now. We're in somewhat of a lull. If you were to map out COVID across the country, we're one of the lowest states right now. We had our Delta surge, it was terrible. We've now recovered from our Delta surge. Hospitalizations for the past month have been amongst the lowest numbers that we have ever recorded since we started counting in Louisiana. It's heartbreaking to watch what's happening in other states, Michigan, Alaska, for example, right now. But we're in a much better place right now. Percent positivity has been relatively low. This week it's at 2.3%. And we have 213 patients hospitalized with COVID. That's down from over 3,000 at the peak of our Delta surge. So what should we be doing with that? We need to use this timing to our advantage. We were somewhat fortuitous with our Delta surge that it hit us when it did and not now, not as flu season is about to begin, not as the weather's about to be cold and really drive people indoors. That was, that was lucky for us. We need to capitalize on that right now and we need to be using the time now to increase vaccinations across the state as much as possible. And that also goes for people getting their booster shot. As the governor said earlier this week, the CDC 
recommended boosters in anyone 18 and above who is six months out or more from their Pfizer or Moderna, they already had recommended boosters for people 18 and above who were more than two months out from their Johnson & Johnson. We made those recommendations about a week earlier. They still stand. The data is coming in. It's unequivocal right now that boosters increase your protection, and now is the time to do it if you are eligible. I am thinking about Omicron like a storm that is out in the Gulf, way, way out in the Gulf. And, and I can tell you now that we're three days out from hurricane season, I'm allowed to make that analogy. Way, way out in the Gulf. You don't know what the track's going to be. You don't know exactly where it's going to go. You don't know exactly how strong it's going to be when it gets there. But you're paying attention. And you're probably preparing. Right now, preparing means getting vaccinated. And if you or your loved ones have not done so or have not gotten boosted and you're eligible, now's the time to do it. I'm positive. I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any. Yeah. Uh, what are you guys seeing with the uh, vaccin rate, vaccination rates lately in terms, are they plateauing? Um, and if so, what are, uh, what are some ways that, you know, you guys are trying to get those out? Yeah, it's a great question. They, they have been relatively steady. We've been on average really for over a month now, almost probably six weeks, getting about 2,000 new individuals getting beginning their vaccine series every day, people that haven't yet been vaccinated. Uh, you know, I, I and the governor want that number to be much higher. I, I guess I'm somewhat thankful that it's not lower than that. Um, but that's, that's where it is. I'll tell you, we continue to push as much as possible. We continue to run community events and have people show up to get vaccinated that I don't think would have showed up had we not done that. There was one at the quarters facility in Baton Rouge very recently, and that was very well attended. It was a big success. We continue to promote and incentivize the vaccine. The shot for $100, $100 for your first shot has been extended throughout the end of this year. And we continue to combat myths and misinformation everywhere we find them. And I think we're going to have to continue doing that. You know, I don't think I see much of that stopping. Omicron is it is it the the possibility that it is uh, vaccine resistant is it you know sickness is it I mean what, what what's your biggest concern when it comes to Omicron? You know, I'm looking back again through the variants that we've kind of kept our eye on in, in the past and now there's like a whole Greek alphabet of them um, you know I think what would make me the most concerned is if we learn that it's both resistant to some degree um, to the protections we have and more transmissible. I, I think that combination would, would certainly be cause for concern. Uh, you know, there, there, there's been variants, in fact, one that was first identified in South Africa months and months and months ago that we were watching that did have resistance, but it proved not to be more transmissible. So I think um, from what I know now, if, if both of those two things are in place at the same time, that's, that signals that it's more likely to cause a problem for you. But again, we, you know, we are significantly more protected now, not as protected as we need to be, but, but more than we were before. So I think that's, that's where it lies. Yes, sir. What are some key things that we learned from the Delta surge that we can apply to this if Omicron ends up having as many hospitalizations as we yeah. had over the summer? Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. And um, you know, it's important that now that we are in a lull, we also do the hard work of going back, doing hot washes, trying to trying to pick out what went well and what could have been improved and all of that. The first thing I will say is don't wait to get vaccinated. Um, we saw a big spike in our vaccination rates. You know, we've been right now at, as I said, about 2,000 new vaccine initiations a day. That's been the case for, you know, about six weeks or so. At the peak of Delta, we were up above 10,000 a day. And I mean, talking to people who got vaccinated then after waiting months and months of not doing it, and people were afraid. You know, it's, it's a small state. Everyone knew someone that was affected by Delta. People knew people that were sick and in the hospital and ICUs, and that's scary, and that drove behavior. So the challenge now, I think, is you know, how do you continue to communicate that risk, that lesson, without people having to live through it themselves? Yep, yeah, please. I wanted to ask you a separate question about um, the immunization schedule. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a hearing on Monday. Um, there's some opposition to this rule. Yeah. Some lawmakers have described um, COVID as a disease that doesn't impact children and says that because its impact on children is less than maybe 
older adults, it shouldn't be added to this immunization schedule. I want to ask sort of your reaction to this notion that um, you know this isn't a disease that you know impacts children in a significant way. Yeah, it's a gross misrepresentation. First, to clarify a couple of um, the points of misunderstanding about this proposed rule. Number one, uh, it will only apply to ages which have received full licensure and uh, an approval from the FDA. This is the absolute highest bar of safety and efficacy that the US government has to offer. At the moment, that's just ages 16 and 17. Um, the second point to make is we respect parental and student choice in Louisiana when it comes to vaccinations, and we have rather broad exemptions. We allow for medical, religious, and personal philosophical exemptions. Um, that doesn't change. So no one will ever be forced to get the vaccine against their will. Those exemptions are, are still there. This, vex, this virus does affect children in profound ways, and it's really scary I think when people minimize that. We've had 18 children die in Louisiana from COVID-19. Nine of those children died in this past Delta surge. We've had over 275 kids suffer with multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. That's a terrible, terrible complication of COVID. Three of those kids are still in the ICU. One in four kids have lost a caregiver to COVID nationwide, and we're not over. And there's likely more to come. So I would never minimize that, and I would ask people to look seriously at the effect this has had on families throughout the state. Yeah, last question. I know you said that the information is still preliminary. I mean, is this, from what we're seeing though, is this leaning more toward, I don't know, to, to put it in, very simple terms, more of a common cold type symptoms, or is this something that that, that we expect to pick up in in, in severity uh, as we get more cases? That's that's a good question. Way way too early to tell. You know, I mean, it's just it's it's way too new to see. I, I think we would all like to hear news that it that is less virulent, meaning it makes people less sick with more mild symptoms. But we just won't know that um, for some time. Listen, um, thank you. I do want to wish everyone again um, happy Thanksgiving. Hope everyone's safe. Um, pleased to have Dr. Mitchell here from LSU and our Lady of the Lake. And I think it's important, as you asked the question about Delta, to keep in mind what we just very recently went through. And Dr. Mitchell um, and her team can give a firsthand experience of what that was like and perhaps what lessons we can carry forward to us um, in response to that very good question that was asked. Dr. Mitchell. Good morning, thank you guys uh, for having me. Um, as Dr. Cantor and Governor Edwards said, uh, my name is Dr. Miranda Mitchell. I'm an internal medicine physician with LSU who practices at Our Lady of the Lake Hospital. I take care of hospitalized adult patients. Um, and as I reflect on my time caring for patients during the Delta surge in the late summer, the emotion that comes to mind is fear. Fear because when I took care of patients, um, both hospitalized with COVID and non-COVID illnesses, my experiences with those patients admitted with COVID, the fear that they experienced resonated most with me. And that was because for the majority of the patients that I took care of, they were otherwise healthy individuals who had not been vaccinated against COVID-19. And these patients were now admitted to the hospital with a life-threatening medical illness um, related to complications from COVID-19 infection. The most common complication that they experienced was difficulty with breathing, uh, which required treatment, um, including supplemental oxygen to support their breathing. And for a person who has never been in a hospital before and never had a major medical illness, now being relegated to having oxygen in their nose attached to a wall, um, having the intense sensation of shortness of breath with every activity, something as simple as leaning forward to reach for their cell phone if it started to ring would result in significant shortness of breath with drop of their oxygen levels. Um, and to go in their room day after day, 
and sit with them and hear their stories and see the fear, the terrifying fear in their eyes, that was difficult. Just as afraid as they were, I was afraid because that one patient in front of me was in the scarcest resource that we had at that time, which was a hospital bed. I knew that although there was a patient in front of me that I was caring for, that there were that many plus more patients in the emergency department waiting room that were vying to get into that bed, that scarce resource, um, because we were at the brink of um, being able to provide care because all of our beds were full. As a doctor uh, who's dedicated her life to care for patients and try to get them in the best state of health as possible, it's immensely disturbing to have a patient where you feel like you can't help them. And the reason that you can't help them is because you can't get to them because there's no bed. And I applaud our hospital administration and our staff um, in creating beds in the hospital wherever it was safe to create a bed. Um, but it was my biggest fear that there would be a patient who was unstable and would have a complication of their COVID-19 infection and we weren't able to get to them. Those are the type of stories that you hear people talk about in war zones and natural catastrophes and major crises. But that was our reality. That is what we saw day in and day out for weeks during the late summer, during the Delta surge. And it was scary. And we don't wanna go back there. What I can do is share my story with you guys and hope that this encourages you to stay as safe as possible. As a state, we've made tremendous progress with COVID-19 and the fight against COVID-19. And we don't wanna let our guard down. We don't wanna go back to where we were this summer and push our healthcare system to the brink. How can we prevent that? As Dr. Cantoris and, Dr. and uh, Governor Edwards has said, we wanted you all to stay safe. And one of the best tools we have to keep you safe is vaccination. So please get vaccinated. If you are vaccinated, get your booster because we have holiday seasons coming up and we know people are gonna be tempted to gather because we haven't been able to do so for so long. But we want you to be safe because Delta is still here and we don't want another surge of Delta to push our hospitals to the brink again. That's not something that any of us want. And if we can do anything to avoid that, please stay safe. That's all I have. Any questions? Yes. I'm wondering, how did it feel to be in this, uh, working during this surge, knowing that there was this vaccine available and that could have prevented this mm -hmm. for, for so many of your patients? I mean, what sort of emotions were, were your patients feeling and, and sort of were you as a physician feeling in that mm -hmm. moment? So from the patient perspective, as I sat with them and heard their stories, it was kind of a mixed bag, surprisingly, um, for patients in the hospital very sick from COVID-19. I did get some patients who said that they still didn't want to be vaccinated, which was mind blowing to me, but that was that their experience. Thankfully, the majority of patients, their hospitalization was a wake up call and they vowed to me that as soon as it was safe as possible, they were going to be vaccinated and that they were gonna tell their friends and families to get vaccinated. And I say that because um, some people need a little bit more time and that's fine, but get vaccinated. Do the research, talk to your medical professionals and do what you can to stay safe. Um, and like I said, right now, the best tool we have is vaccination. From a provider standpoint, I treat every patient. So whether the patient is vaccinated or not, it doesn't change how I treat them. But if the patient is unvaccinated, I go that extra effort to do the education to make sure that we stress how important vaccination is um, and how potentially it can prevent severe illness in not only them, but their families. Any other questions? Thank you guys. Thank you, Dr. Cantor and Dr. Mitchell. Um, 
obviously the message we want everyone to take away today um, is that we want people to be aware and concerned, but certainly not panicked. Um, and quite frankly, the things that we are asking people to do today are the things we were asking them to do uh, over the last number of months. Uh, because it remains the case that in order to protect yourself, your family, your community, to have less disruptions to schools, to businesses, to the economy, is for people uh, to be vaccinated and to be boosted. And to not wait. Um, because it takes three weeks uh, on the Pfizer to get fully vaccinated. Or actually, it takes a little longer than that because you're going to have to have three weeks between shots, and then you're fully vaccinated uh, 12, 14 days after that. It's 28 days between the shots on the Moderna. The other reason you don't want to wait is because we now know that the booster shot, that third shot, actually confers protection that's four to five times stronger than it ever was after just the second shot. But you can't get that until six months after you've completed. So the sooner you put these things in motion, the more protected you are going to be. And so waiting just doesn't make sense. You can see that what we're doing here in Louisiana is, is mirrors what's happening on the federal level. Um, obviously, we remain in a public health emergency. I extended uh, that declaration at the end of November, didn't add any new mitigation uh, measures or, or anything like that. Uh, but obviously, we remain engaged in this fight against this pandemic every single day. Yesterday, President Biden announced strategies for addressing uh, the Omicron variant uh, that do not require major disruption of our lives, and that's a good thing. It means we focus on frequent testing, genetic sequencing, on vaccines, on boosters, the same things we're doing here in Louisiana. Um, and because we don't know much about Omicron, and because we haven't detected it here, some people have probably uh, taken too much uh, assurance from that. The fact of the matter is, uh, we have hundreds of people tested positive every single day, uh, all of them currently from the Delta variant. Uh, and, and I just want to talk about where we were at this point last year heading into uh, the holiday season with Christmas and New Year's, for example. Um, there were 174 people hospital, I'm sorry, 1,074 people hospitalized with COVID-19 on Thanksgiving Day last year. By Christmas Day, that increased to 1,540. And on January the 7th, it was 2,069. Now that was all pre-Delta. The Delta variant came and resulted in a surge of hospitalizations uh, whereby on August the 17th, which was just a few months ago, we had the highest number of people hospitalized at any point in the pandemic at 3,022. We don't want to go back there. We don't want to go back to August. We don't want to go back to last January. We don't want to go back to last Christmas Day. And we don't have to because we have things available to us today that weren't available a year ago. And principally, that is the vaccine. We are doing better today. And while if you're one of the people who are sick with COVID-19, then as it relates to you, I mean, this, static, this statistic doesn't necessarily mean much. If you're in the hospital, if you just lost a loved one, and, and we still haven't had a single day uh, since about, about March the 13th of 2020, where Dr. Kanner has been able to tell me we had zero people die. But we don't want to go back there. Um, we have 213 people in the hospital today with COVID-19 across the state of Louisiana. And Dr. Mitchell's probably very thankful that the, the number of people hospitalized there filling those beds is much smaller uh, than it was just a few months ago. And I want to thank her and by extension through her, all healthcare professionals across the state of Louisiana 
I'm talking doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, EMT, paramedics. They have been truly heroic. That's another reason to do what we can now so that we don't go back there, so that we don't push these individuals and our whole healthcare delivery system to the brink again. There's just no reason uh, for that. So in order to continue, and I think Dr. Kanner mentioned this a while ago, to um, increase the number of vaccinations as best we can, we have decided, um, and I think we announced on Tuesday that we're extending the Shot for 100 program through the end of the year, December the 31st. This provides a $100 debit card to Louisianans who are newly going sleeves up, which means getting their, their first shot. It was extended because we want to make sure that with the holidays upon us, uh, that people have that added incentive, just a little bit of a nudge. Uh, perhaps that's what it takes uh, to get them protected as they gather with loved ones. Um, on November the 30th, just recently, we had the highest participation day uh, in the Shot for 100 since the program began uh, with 1,646 people uh, getting their first shot in a single day. Uh, we have seen very high participation, for example, on college campuses recently as they prepare both for uh, the holiday break that they're getting and also for the spring semester uh, that is right around the corner. The families of children age 5 to 11 are also eligible uh, for this incentive. Uh, so we encourage those families to please consider taking advantage of the program um, and understand that, that uh, when you gather, especially indoors, um, and typically around the holidays, you gather with, with people of different generations, three, four uh, generations in, in one place. Uh, those older people, those sicker people, uh, are more likely to, to have a, a severe outcome uh, should they contract the disease. And so having as many people there vaccinated as possible uh, will make sure that it's as safe as it can be. We're also very excited that 48 community pharmacies and 26 parishes are now offering the $100 uh, debit card. Uh, that should uh, make it easier for some folks who haven't been able to make it out to some of the other events that we've been staging across the state of Louisiana. And for more information about Shot for 100, we do encourage people to visit shotfor100.com or you can call Louisiana's COVID-19 vaccine hotline. It's one 855-453-0774. Um, and that hotline can, in addition to explaining uh, more about the Shot for 100 program, it can answer questions about vaccines and can connect callers to medical professionals to address any additional questions. Uh, before I take questions, I'll announce, I don't know when the next press conference is gonna be. I know that we're gonna do in a couple of weeks a uh, year end press conference, and, but if we need to do one before then, we will certainly let you know. So if you have questions, I'll be happy to take them. Yes, sir. I just want to ask about the immunization schedule. Um, it's my understanding that, and really the buck stops with you, unless you decide that you don't want to implement the rules, then the rule will go forward and being uh, added to the, or it'll be be added. Um, do, do you have any intention of, of backtracking on that rule, or is it in your mind you are, this is what, what's going to happen? I would have to learn something different than, than I've learned to date, uh, whether it be something pertaining to the law or to the vaccine, some medical reason. Um, I don't anticipate that that will happen. I've done a, a really a deep dive already, um, and I I think for all the reasons that Dr. Kanner mentioned a while ago, I'd also refer you to an excellent letter to the editor that I read this morning uh, in The Morning Advocate from Dr. Klein, um, who this is his specialty in, in um, he's with Children's Hospital in New Orleans. For all those reasons and many more, it is certainly my inclination uh, that uh, the, the vaccine will be added to the schedule that pertains to K through 12 schools uh, and higher ed. And that will happen um, this, you know, through a very transparent, open rulemaking process uh, where the, the notice went out, public input uh, has been gathered. There's gonna be oversight, uh, hearings by the legislature and, and so forth. Um, 
but I just think it's it's really important uh, to embrace the science, um, and and really it's also important to to not engage in in misinformation, and and there's an awful lot of that out there as well. So, for example, um, while I personally think it would be a mistake, it'll be up to parents uh, to decide uh, whether their kids if get vaccinated or not. That's consistent with the way we do uh, other vaccinations as well, and we're not going to change that. It will only be, um, at least initially, uh, for those students who are 16 and 17 years old, because that's where the full FDA authorization is right now. Uh, and you know, the, the FDA authorization comes uh, to us, and, and, and that we should all be able uh, to understand that that means that there have been clinical trials. Uh, and that this is a safe and effective vaccine uh, for these populations and that uh, the risk to these young people from COVID-19 uh, is, is significant enough, serious enough, uh, that, that the uh, vaccine is warranted for them. But it's also part of a larger effort to make sure that we're dealing with the pandemic. Since the 1st of August, uh, at least 25% of all known cases of COVID-19 in Louisiana have been in, in children 18 or below. We know that the younger you are, the more likely it is that you have an asymptomatic case. If you have an asymptomatic case, you're probably not testing. So that 25% number in all likelihood understates the degree of transmission that's happening in that age group. The myth that there are not serious cases and deaths, hospitalizations, including intensive care and so forth because of COVID-19 and because of the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, that's just false. But we also know if you're infected, you're infectious. And if you want to avoid disruptions uh, in school because of outbreaks and, and the illnesses that occur in families and in communities and so forth, uh, this is part of, of the overall effort. Uh, so it's important for the children, for themselves to be vaccinated, uh, but it's also important for everyone else. This is a public health emergency. Um, and, and so I guess that's a long answer to a short question, uh, but absent some uh, compelling reason, which I, at present, um, have not seen. Uh, I, would, I would fully expect that we will, we will be adding uh, the vaccine to the schedule. Yes. Given what we've seen in other countries and other states going on right now with uh, implementing restrictions again, um, should we start to see a rise in cases from Omicron, given what you've learned over the last year and change? Um, are restrictions still on the table, or will you rely more on personal responsibility to get the vaccine to keep things under control? Well, you know, if, if we ever get to the point where we are going to outstrip our capacity to deliver life-saving care to people, whether it's individuals with COVID or all the other people who need those same hospital beds and the attention of those same doctors and, and nurses and respiratory therapists for whatever reason, then you have to consider those things. Now, I, but at the present, I mean, my mind isn't there. I mean, we're, we're nowhere near that. Um, if, if we will all do uh, what is prudent at this point, it's much less likely that we ever get there. Um, and, and while we have this new variant out there that, that, that's circulating and we have a lot of questions about it, uh, it is true that we're much better off than we've ever been, not just in the current baseline numbers, but the percentage of people who have chosen to be vaccinated. Um, in addition to those who have some natural immunity, even though it's inferior to the protection you get from vaccination, it is not to be discounted. Um, and so we're, we're better off. There are more therapeutic interventions and so forth. And, and as the vaccine is available to a larger a percentage of the population. Um, and so it, it is way too premature. It would be my hope that we would never have to go back and reimpose um, 
any additional mitigation measures. Uh, but as I've said all along, you know, in a public health emergency, you have to do what is necessary so that you can protect public health. And if that is ever threatened because we, we're going to overwhelm our health care delivery system, then I think everything is on the table. Uh, but we don't want to go back there. I don't see that uh, on the horizon today, uh, but I, I, I do want to answer your question. But I, I, I do think the, 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 it's, just, it's just too premature uh, to speculate on that. Yes, sir. So if the rule goes into, a, uh, it, it moves forward, it could by the end of the year be, I guess, implemented. But I guess there's a question of enforcement, like when exactly would this start for 16, yeah. page 16 and up? Is this the sort of thing that would start in the next school year? Yeah, with, okay. yeah we, we, would, we would look for this to be effective for the start of the 2022 school year. So you look in, in, in August. Or was that it? Look, I want to thank you all for continuing to, to cover this. this. is obviously very important. I, and I want to thank the people of Louisiana who, who have done uh, what has, is necessary and, and prudent uh, to protect themselves and to protect others. Um, and, and just ask that those people who haven't yet, for whatever reason, uh, decided to be vaccinated, today is a new day. Uh, and just end with this with this last message. This, the sooner you start the vaccination series, the sooner you will have the protection that you need that will put you in the best possible position to avoid contracting COVID in the first place and to have an, an uneventful uh, case of the disease should you contract it. Um, it gives you the very best possible chance. And in addition to what it does for yourself, this is how we, all of us together get through this pandemic. And so I, I do commend it to you. I suspect, and I've said this before, that there's not much I can say. Maybe there's not much that Dr. Kanner can say that's gonna cause people to change their minds at this point. So reach out to your own doctor. Have this conversation with your physician. And, and uh, hopefully after that, you will, you will make the decision. Look, thank you all. We will let you know uh, when the next uh, press conference is, although I do know now that we have one scheduled for the annual year end, and uh, I do look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you, and God bless.